Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Kathy Miller, and I am the Director of Community Supports here at the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University. I'm so pleased that you're all joining us this evening for our webinar. I want to tell you a little bit about the Institute on Disabilities. We are one of 67 university centers for excellence in developmental and other disabilities. And our vision here at the Institute on Disabilities, which is on the screen, is that we are a society where all people are valued and respected and where all people have the knowledge, opportunity, and power to improve their lives and the lives of others. Our mission is that we learn and work with people with disabilities and their families in diverse communities across Pennsylvania to create and share knowledge, change systems, and promote self-determined lives so that disability is recognized as a natural part of the human experience. This project uh, is Competence and Confidence, Partners in Policymaking, Family Leadership, which we fondly refer to as C2P2. It is brought to you, of course, by the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University, and funding for this project comes from the Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Council. C2P2 Family Leadership in Inclusive Education for Non-Traditional Schools is designed for families of students with disabilities who are educated in home schools, cyber charter schools, charter schools, private schools, and parochial schools. We also include administrators and staff by providing them support within these settings. The goal of the project is to create a network of family leaders who will work together with educators and administrators to champion inclusive practices for children with, it, with disabilities in the non-traditional school community. Our project activities include online leadership development training, such as the webinar that we are about to conduct this evening. We also provide free one-on-one -on -one parent consultation and supports from trained parent consultants. And we have a number of online resources that I'm going to go over very briefly this evening before we get to what you're all here for, our wonderful speaker and our subject on social capital. So we have a number of webinars. And as you see on your screen, <clears throat> we have all of our webinars that we have conducted in the past four years are archived and on our website. So we, and with a focus again on inclusion. So we have, we have a session on uh, talking about how to make adaptations and modifications for success. Um, what do you do with um, calming the chaos, positive behavioral support, family coaching, building safe and healthy relationships, cyber safety, uh, how to keep kids safe in this digital world, Understanding evaluations, what do the results mean for your child? Community connections, enriched, engaged, and included. Creating a vision for your child's future. How to be a good team member. Um, and also um, one of our most popular ones, your child's rights, learning the laws and rules to support your, ch your child's education. And a real basic on what is inclusion? We talk about inclusion, but how are what are the methods and the practices to support all abilities of students learning together? One of the best, um, and I do, that's my opinion, but one of the um, great benefits of this particular project is that we do provide one-on-one -on -one parent consultation. And this is absolutely free to anyone who makes a request um, to receive some guidance and technical assistance. We are uh, working collaboration with Pennsylvania's parent consultants from the Pennsylvania Education for All Coalition, PEAK. And PEAK consultants are matched with family members who make the request to locate resources and supports, help you understand your child's rights, that reviewing your child's individual education plan or their um, evaluation report. P consultants can assist you with strategies to support your child's inclusive education, giving you suggestions and ideas for accommodations and supports 
for your child's specific needs. Uh, many times they attend uh, individual education plan meetings, IEP meetings, um, during transition times, um, or whatever it is that you really um, feel like you need some one-on-one -on -one, uh, consulting with. Support can be offered in person, over the phone, or by email as needed. So to request a PEAK parent consultant, you can go to our website and complete the form. You'll see the website listed uh, right below the, um, the words on the screen at this point. And I know that you are all familiar with that website because that's how you um, came to register for this session. So please feel free to take advantage of this wonderful service that is offered through um, this project. Some of the online resources that we have available, there is a C2P2 Family Leadership Facebook page. It's a closed group, which gives you some confidentiality and the anonymity to um, really speak your mind and to speak to one another. So you can click, uh, go to that uh, reference right there, www.facebook.com groups, and there's a long set of numbers. If you need some assistance, you can give us a call with that. But that is, if you click, um, if you jot that down, um, you can go right to that Facebook page and be a member of the group. So you just simply go there and click join group and within a day or two um, you'll be accepted into the group and you can post and read comments. Um, in addition, yes, to, to that on the website I just wanted to let you know that there are some resources available to you. Um, and this year's plan is that we are having additional uh, webinars and in April we will be um, providing you with a webinar on for homeschoolers and evaluations. And we are also offering this year a new uh, short video vignettes uh, archive will be available to everybody. So we, um, these are primarily designed for busy administrators, but I think that they will be helpful to, to everyone. So if you're a parent member on this, uh, parent member, if you're a family member, if you're a parent and you're here this evening, so uh, look forward to seeing some of those. We're going to have um, Patrick Schwartz as our first person talking about um, inclusion, inclusive education, so that should be very interesting. So if you need more information about C2P2FL, Kathy Rachiameyer is our Family Education Coordinator. Many of you probably know Kathy. Um, her voice um, Telephone number is there. We certainly have the TTY if you need to take advantage of that. Um, our, our fax number and Kathy's um, email address, which is Kathy with a C, rm at temple.edu. Before we get to tonight's speaker, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the housekeeping items. So if you have any questions about tonight's topic, please feel free to type in the chat area. You click the button at the top right of your screen to open and close that chat panel, and uh, you type in your question and just click send. So um, it seems to be an easy enough process. Uh, we, our speaker has agreed to, so you will certainly take questions, and we would prefer to just leave those questions till the end. So we'll be jotting down your questions, and they'll uh, take time to be sure to answer those. We'll have 15 minutes at the end to um, answer questions. The other thing that's very important, if we would ask you all to please take a moment and immediately following the, tonight's webinar, if you would just complete a brief evaluation. The evaluation takes about five minutes, but it's really important for us to uh, give feedback to our funder. This is the last year of funding for this particular project, but we always do like to um, see how we can improve uh, and making our sessions more accessible and uh, useful to the people who come and listen to them, and also um, to, to give some feedback on how valuable um, our efforts are in uh, providing parent training to uh, the community. So uh, what will happen is after you close out of the session this evening, a, um, a pop-up will appear on your screen, and um, you will be able to uh, answer those questions right there. If you have joined us by phone, just watch your email for a link to the survey, and we'll be sending that to you. So, without further ado, I'm really excited 
because tonight we have um, Kathy Ficartero, who was formerly the um, the CEO of the Council of Quality and Leadership. Kathy's resume is long. Um, she is uh, was a provider um, providing very quality services to um, individuals. Kathy's from Illinois and joining us from there this evening. She's going to be talking about building social capital to support inclusive lives. Kathy is also a mom of uh, Beth. She's also she is a leader in our field. And I am very honored to call her a friend of mine. So um, Kathy will be telling you a little bit more about herself. But without further ado, I would like to turn the um, controls over to Kathy. So you'll be hearing for, from Kathy, and she will be doing her presentation. So um, I'm going to attempt to do that. Where Amy is. Aha. It's done nicely. So. Kathy, you have the stage now. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Okay. Well, thanks, Kathy. It's always good to hear from you. You're amazing. And these parents, um, welcome and good evening. Uh, how fortunate you are to have such a great University Center of Excellence at Temple and the resources that they are providing to you, so I hope that you'll take advantage of them. We're going to talk about um, bridges to the community using social capital, and I always like to start off with a, a picture of my daughter who happens to have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Beth just turned 30, but when she went off to school uh, 25 years ago, we were met at the door by the principal who said, we don't take those children here. And I smiled as sweetly as I could, and I squeezed Beth's hand, who fortunately at the time didn't really understand speech, um, and just said in a sweet tone to the, to the principal, you know, why don't you go back to your office and close the door, and maybe you might like to call your attorney and tell your attorney what you just said to me. And in the meantime, I'll get um, Beth signed up for Girl Scouts. Um, and so um, as our children go off to school, it's my opinion that one of the most important things in addition to learning is friendships uh, because we know in the data outside of disability, the data for all people, that people who have friends are safer. And so to me, one of the most important skill sets that we can give to our children is a way to not only make friends, but the most difficult part, of course, is then to maintain those friendships. When my daughter went off to school, there were many opportunities as well as barriers. And so the first opportunity I took is that I happened to have a pediatrician who had a child with a disability. And I asked him if he would write me a physician's order for full inclusion, and he did. And then the school didn't know what to do with it, but they had to follow it because it was technically a doctor's order. The other thing I did was in her IEP every year, I made sure that one of her goals was that Beth would be supported to interact with students without disabilities in a typical classroom. And so that's what we did. But what I learned is that for Beth, um, she could make a friend, but she didn't know how to keep that friend. And so we're going to talk about social capital and what that means and how that works. Now, gosh, what's this thing called social capital? Well, it's really kind of friendship. But really, parts of friendship is, is based on a theory of social capital. It's nothing new. It doesn't come from the disability research. It comes from social work. It first appeared in print in 1950 and was used and is used today quite extensively by the World Bank. And so the World Bank defines social capital as those, those relationships that let people coordinate actions so that they can achieve their goals. And so what the World Bank found out is that when they were working in undeveloped countries and trying to help people um, become employed, they were just funding it. And it really wasn't a success. And when they looked at the research in social capital, they realized that they not only had to give people seed money, 
as well as jobs training, but also information about how to set up a system of social capital where they were sharing and partnering with each other so that they could be successful. Everything from, gosh, if you could watch my kids for an hour uh, while I work, um, I'll make a double batch of dinner tonight and we'll share dinner together. Or if your husband can give me a ride into town so I can get the parts I need in order to build more products that I can sell, um, I can, you know, do something for you as well. And so one of the things we find with people with disabilities, especially um, teenagers and young adults, is that they don't typically have a lot of experience giving back. They have a lot of experience where people want to be their best buddy and a lot of experience where the teachers are facilitating other children to socialize, but how is it that we're showing them how to give back? And so all people may be created equal, but we each are really born into different circumstances and with different amounts of social capital. Gosh, what do I mean? Well, I was working with a single mom who gave birth to a child. She was from Haiti. She was in New York City. And after she gave birth to this child with Down syndrome, occasionally the public health nurse would come by, but she didn't really have a lot of social capital. Her family was all back in Haiti. She hadn't really been in the country long enough to establish relationships and friendships. And so that baby was born into a circumstance of a caring, loving, single mom who didn't have a lot of social capital in her life. Compared to, I understand, in Pennsylvania, where there are communities that include a large number of people who are Italian. And in these communities that include a large number of people who are Italian, they tend as a family to get together on Sunday at Nana's house for pasta with red sauce. And sometimes there's as many as 10, 20, 30, 40 cousins and, and five, 10 aunts and uncles and a Nana and a Papa and all kinds of people. And people who aren't even related that are invited to go to Nana's for dinner. And so if I was part of that family and I was a young mom and I gave birth to a child with Down syndrome, Probably there may be as many as 20, 25, 30 people at Nana's for, for Sunday dinner, and probably somebody's going to know about an early intervention program, and in that case, I would probably have been born as the child with Down syndrome into a family with a whole lot of social capital. But we can all build it if we work hard enough. This is a picture of my friend Mike. And Mike went to high school in a different town, and then he decided he wanted to go to the college in the town where I live. And in that college, there are there is a uh, college program, like at Temple, for um, young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. But in order to attend, Michael needed to also have a part-time job. And so somebody knew somebody who knew me and linked us up and asked if I could help Michael find a job. And so together we did some searching and with my social capital, Michael was able to get a job at the local grocery store. And now when I go to that grocery store, which happens to be my grocery store, you know, Mike not only says hi, but he greets me and if he's not real busy, he'll say, oh, Mrs. T. Is this a big shopping day or a little shopping day? And a big shopping day means, oh, I got to get everything on my list. Well, in addition to being a professional in the field for over 40 years and having a daughter with intellectual and developmental disabilities who's 30 years old, so yes, I was a professional for 10 years and then gave birth to a child with IDD, um, I also, about 15 years ago, was in a terrible car wreck and sustained a, um, a traumatic brain injury. And as a result, I've come pretty far back, but I have absolutely no mapping skills. So, you know, I can't drive without my GPS, but also um, 
you need a map in a grocery store. And my brain just doesn't seem to be able to put that map of the grocery store in my head. And so if it's a big grocery day, it means I have plenty of time and I'm just going to go up and down the aisles and see what I see and decide what I want. Um, and every day is a new day when I go to the grocery store because I can't remember like what's there. Um, but if it's a little shopping day and Mike's not busy, he'll say, hey, Mrs. T, I can help. What's for dinner? And I'll say, oh, tonight we're going to have sloppy joes. And he'll like be, okay, let's go. And he'll take me to the meat counter and say, what do you need? And we get the ground beef. And then he says, bread, right? And I said, yeah. And then we go to the bread aisle that Michael finds for me and we get the buns. And then he says, are we making them from scratch or? And I said, no, the mamwich aisle, Mike. And so we go to the mamwich aisle, we get some chips, get some tomatoes. And there I go. I'm so happy. And I've just like saved an hour. And I go to check out. Michael's my bagger, although he's just been promoted to cashier. And he says, what's time dinner, Mrs. T? And I said, well, tonight, Mike, we're eating at 6. He goes, you know, I get off at 6 tonight. I said, well, did you want to join us? And so I don't pay Michael to be my guide in the grocery store. Michael doesn't pay me occasionally to come for dinner. And when it's, Michael rides his bike to work in, in the winter when it snows in Chicago where we live, um, Michael will text me and say, any chance I can get a ride? Um, so social capital, uh, reciprocity. Uh, Michael got his job because somebody knew somebody who said, hey, Kathy Terrell knows how to get people with disabilities a job. And now that Michael has that job at the grocery store, he's my uh, map uh, in the grocery store. There are a lot of books written about social capital. One was written by a fellow named Pierce Bordeaux, and he wrote a book called Social Capital and the Creation of Human Capital. And so what he says in his book is that social capital are those advantages and opportunities that accrue, accrue or grow for people through their membership in groups. But when we think about our kids, what groups do we have them join? So hopefully you're thinking about supporting your son or daughter, if they're interested, to be part of groups and clubs, whether it's the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts or the 4-H or the chess club or the after school basketball club or whatever that is. Because in those groups is where we learn about friendships and where we learn about giving of yourself as well as as being a good friend. And then as people age, it's so important to link people with disabilities to not just disability groups. I mean, it's important to link them to people first in the self-advocacy group. That's essential. It's important, though, also to find out if they want to be spiritually active with a church and to link them to a church where they feel comfortable and they can have their needs met. There's so many different social clubs like the Lions, the Rotary, the Kiwanis, and more and more, they're so welcoming to people with disabilities to join their organization. And it's everywhere, and it's in all facets of life. This is Dina. Dina is the young woman at the microphone. She's about 36 years old. Those are his, her parents, Jan and Alan Bergman, and her rabbi. And for years, Dina wanted to be an active member of um, the Jewish synagogue. And although she was allowed to attend and to participate, no rabbi thought her worthy to um, go through her bat mitzvah. Bat mitzvah in the, in the Christian church is similar to kind of confirmation. And she joined a new church, and this rabbi, um, she said, I want to get involved in my, in my, I'm sorry, she joined, joined in the synagogue. The rabbi said, she said, to the rabbi, I want to get more involved. And so she started as a greeter. And then she started helping at the social functions. And then she started helping in the catechism class. And she started to learn all kinds of things. And the rabbi decided that she too should be able to have the opportunity to make her bat mitzvah. And so he adapted the curriculum, and here she is in Israel with her parents um, doing her bat mitzvah. So how do we help children, students in particular, build social capital to enhance their lives? Um, 
I know that for my daughter, not only did she have intellectual and developmental disabilities, but she had complex allergies that presented themselves neurologically. And some of the big things that she was allergic to was corn, corn syrup. Um, she could have sugar, but not corn syrup. But if you look at typical children treats, they almost all have corn syrup in it. And so when it was someone's birthday and they brought a treat, we just brought a bag of treats for Beth Terrell so that if a, a child brought cupcakes, she didn't have to say, no, thank you, I can't have it, or, you know, some kind of, you know, Rice Krispie treats. Um, the kids knew to say, wait, Beth, I'll go into your, your bag and I'll, I'll get, I'll pick you a treat, um, for, for my birthday. Um, and so um, there's so many different ways and so many little things that we can do. Now, one of the things that we do when we have a child with intellectual and developmental disabilities and they're in the school is that they have a plan. They have an IEP, an individual education plan, but most of our children can't read. Yet we hear that our children are supposed to be empowered they're supposed to lead self-determined lives, that they're supposed to be making choices along the way appropriate to their age level. But then we, we design this IEP um, in a format that they don't understand, in a format that they can't read. And I just think, oh my goodness. So I didn't have a chance to um, adapt one of Beth's old IEPs. So what I did is I adapted her individual person-centered plan, and I thought I would show it to you. Um, and so, um, you know, basically her plan is called This Is My Life, This Is My Plan. And the first part of her plan talks about her dreams. Uh, she dreams about going to London with her friend Tia, and in, in how that works out is I need money. If I need money, I need a job. So she has an employment goal, but her dream is to save enough money to go to London with her friend Tia. She wants to exercise more and lose weight, and I would like to say that's altruistic and that's what she really wants to do, but the, so what she really wants to do is to jump out of an airplane. Um, she has cerebral palsy as part of her disability. She wants to jump out of an airplane in a parachute, and she weighs too much money, so in order to jump out of the airplane, she needs to lose weight and exercise more and learn ways to cook and stay healthy. Um, in her plan, she wanted important people in her plan so that in school-based, we had pictures of her family and her friends so that the teachers knew who her friends were and who we should be working on connecting her to. And then also important things to the best, not just goals, but what are what's important to me? Well, she's 30 years old, she has her own condo, she lives there with her service dog, Coco, and one of the things that's important to her is, is having her own bedroom. So it's a mind share in an apartment, but she doesn't want to share her bedroom, and I don't blame her. The other is having enough money, it's important to me too, going out with friends. And instead of this complicated behavior plan, because she does have a behavior plan, the adapted version is that if I get upset, just support me, and if you help me to relax, if I can play video games on my phone, I generally will relax and calm down right away. So oh, she has a number of goals in her plan, and so what we did for each of her goals, we made a goal sheet so that it was quick and easy and she could point to it. If you said to her, Beth, what goals are you working on? Before, she would go, I don't know, you know, or she'd say, it's in that book, I can't read, you know, and so now she has her book, it's a hard-covered book, it's hers, the teacher has one, she has one. Um, and she'll open it up, and she she can't read, maintain st strong relationships, but she can point to this page, and she says, one of my goals is about being a good friend, and, and this is my sister here in the first picture, that's my sister Morgan, and she lives in Spain, and I like to be a good friend to her, and so I get to FaceTime her, 
and and up there is is my friend Linda, and I watch her cat and I I cut her grass, and and she takes me to the flea market. She doesn't pay me to cut her grass, and I don't pay her to take me to the flea market. And so she can go through each of these pictures, but I will point out the picture she's most excited about. And let's see if I can make this pointer work. Uh, this one here, and this is Beth, and this is Chris, her boyfriend. And so um, and she'll point to this picture and get a very big smile on her face and say, my boyfriend, Chris. Now, she can't generally remember people's names, but she can always remember Chris's names. Um, in her book, too, she said, when you make my book with me, Mom, I want to put in my book that if I could have a fifth goal, because she has four goals, if I could have a fifth goal, and it would be to have fun. And can I put pictures of what I like to do for fun so that if people don't know, they this will help. And so here is a picture of Beth with her grandpa and her mom, and we are at a White Sox game. Here's a picture with two of her friends, Michael and Joe, and they're out eating pizza. A friend with her dad and her friend Leanne, they're at a concert. A picture of her walking, her service dog, uh, Coco, and then her a picture of her hanging out with her favorite uncle, Uncle Larry. Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And what he says in his book is that social capital is so important, but social capital is starting to decline, and people are becoming disconnected. What he found is that league bowling has in decreased by 40%. It used to be that lots and lots of people would join a league and go bowling on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night. But now when you have working moms and working dads or two working moms and two working dads, um, they just don't have the time. But individual bowling has increased by 10%. So people still like to bowl, but it sounds like some of them are going out and bowling by themselves. Civic group membership had decreased and volunteering had decreased. But after 9-11, about a year after 9-11, um, what we discovered is that um, the number of volunteer hours is again increasing and on the rise and that people are rejoining those civic groups like the Rotary and the, and the Kiwanis and church groups. Um, church attendance has decreased except for the megachurches. In most states now, you can find these megachurches. They're non-denominational Christian churches. If you go to them on Sunday, like you would a typical Christian church, the parking lot is packed on Sunday morning. But what you'll find in these mega churches is that the parking lot is also packed Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. They not only address the spiritual needs of people, but they're also focusing on the social needs of people. And so at a typical mega church, you'll see that they have a a chess club, they have a book club, they have a kids club, they've got a basketball club, they've got a volleyball club, they've got a parenting class, they have all kinds of classes and activities. We are also finding that they're very, very inclusive and welcoming to people with disabilities. And so that's been very interesting. One of the things that I think that social capital does and why I think it's so important is that as we build friendships, those friendships can sometimes lead to lifelong support. There's a saying, it's not what you know, but who you know. Anybody ever hear that before? Not what you know, but who you know? And what that means is that if I need a job, I might go to somebody and say, hey, do you know where they're hiring? Do you know any place where there's job openings? And somebody might say, gosh, I don't know, but you should ask, you know, Mr. So-and-so down the street. I bet he knows. He works at a bank. He knows all the businesses in town, okay? And so it's often the way you got your job is somebody who knew somebody told somebody and you applied. Now, you interviewed. You had to get the job yourself. You had to develop the skills to keep the job. But oftentimes, if you think about it, 
generally at least 33% of the people I know got their job because somebody knew somebody and told somebody they should apply someplace. Well, if you think about it, if your child is included in school, and they're going to school with children with and without disabilities, those children are going to grow up to be the president of the bank, they're going to be the person who owns the local theater, they're going to be the person who works at the park district, they may be the person who runs the local daycare or who is the local veterinarian. And so if I go in as a total stranger, I'm less likely to have my application hit the top. But if somebody says, well, hi, I'm calling to say, that, that Mary Smith, a friend of mine, put in an application. She's a wonderful person. I've known her for 10 years. She's reliable. She's honest. Well, then that application is going to rise to the top. The same with if I am, you know, the veterinarian in town, and you and I went to school together, and I see your name, and I think, oh, my, I knew Mary Smith. We went to high school together. I'm more likely to have that application go to the top. Now, this is a picture of my friend Devorah. Devorah, in my 40 years, is probably one of the most um, friendly, outgoing, amazing women who happens to have significant complex disabilities. She's medically fragile. She has to have a nurse around with her 24 hours around the clock. She often stops breathing, and uh, an intervention sometimes is done as many as 10 times a day to restart her breathing. And what Devorah can do is smile. She can communicate with her eyes. She can communicate with her smile. She can communicate by squeezing your finger. She can turn her head. She can move her hands. And she can move her arms from her elbows forward. And she can let us know what she likes and doesn't like. And through a series of communications, we discovered that Devora wanted a job. She didn't want to go to the shelter workshop. She wanted to have a job. But we found out that she loved art and that she loved people. And through a series of different job trials and job discoveries, what staff came up with was one of the jobs they tried Devora loved. And what it was is they got her a series of mittens and gloves that they attached different um, kind of um, textures to. And they helped Devora slip the glove or the mitten on with the texture. She dips the texture into paint, and then she rubs it on picture frames. And she sells them online. She has a Facebook page. It's called Frames by Devora. And if you go to Facebook and you put in Frames by Devora and ask to be her friend, she'll friend you. And she has this amazing business because she has this amazing smile and this amazing ability to connect with people. But what's also interesting is by going to craft shows and selling, she got to meet other people who were at craft shows. And with her and her support worker, they discovered that picture frames with dogs on them and picture frames with cats on them and picture frames with things about cats, dogs, snakes, and other pets will sell at pets, pet craft shows. And that where Devorah lives in Chicago, there are numerous pet craft shows. Um, and she now is so busy with her micro industry that she's self-employed and is thinking of hiring other people because she can't make her frames fast enough with the uh, pet theme. She also makes them for grandparents and grandchildren and aunts and uncles, but the big sellers are pets. But the, but the, but the basic message is, is here is a young woman who can't use her voice to speak and who communicates with her eyes and her, and her smile and her hands who's not able to walk, and who needs support even to eat. Uh, but she is an entrepreneur. She's a businesswoman. She owns her own business, and she's so busy. She's thinking about hiring some other people, 
and it was all linked through social capital. The fact that she was even brought to the attention of the provider was somebody who knew somebody who knew that provider had many grants to help people with a job. And then after she went through discovery and got job and started going to craft shows, it was those craft show people that befriended her and told her how she could make more money. So um, I believe with Devorah, all people, no matter what their disability, have the capacity to, to work and to give back and to make friends and to be a friend back. There's also keeping friends, and with Beth, it was difficult because when she was in high school, after the fourth year, her friends went off to college. Well, college kids don't um, email anymore. They just text, and so we had to find software so that Beth could use her voice, since she can't read or write, to speak, and so she was able to get technology where she could speak into a device, a simple device, and then it would um, review orally with her, and then she could send it as a text, and then her friends who went off to school could text her back. So one day, this is Beth, her dad, and her friend Teresa. Now they're at a soccer game. But Teresa's been her friend since kindergarten. And Teresa is away at school becoming a nurse. Well, when Teresa turned 21, she texted Beth back. And she said, hey, Beth, my mom said I could have a party when I come home for Thanksgiving. But we're learning new things in college. And so I need to show you some skills so that you won't be embarrassed at my party so I'm going to come home in, in October, and could I come over and, and show you some new games we play in college, and then you could decide whether you want to play them with me when I have this party at my mom's house. Well, there you go. Now, it's too bad I can't hear because I'm hoping that you're chuckling, but this is something called a beer bong. Yep, you go to a hardware store and you say, I need a funnel and I need flexible plastic tubing. It appears in college that they build these beer bongs. You put your thumb over this end of the tube. Somebody pours an entire, in this case, Rowling Rock, into the funnel. And when you're ready, to move your thumb out of the way, and the beer just somehow goes down your throat. Well, Teresa was such a good friend that um, she knew how many times it took her to learn how to do it. And after about the fourth time in beer all over my kitchen floor, Beth Carroll learned to do it. And so that's a real good friend because friendship is also about trust and trusting. And Teresa knew that Beth would want to try it, but she didn't want her to be embarrassed and have beer all over the place. Now at the party, Beth decided to play beer pong, but not beer bong, okay? And basically, the message is this, is that what a great friend, that she was concerned enough about Beth and that they trusted in each other enough that she taught her a skill that she chose not to use, but that she's still inviting her to parties at her house. With social capital, of course, risk happens. When people are fully included in the community, whether as a student or, 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 or a young adult, sometimes there is um, risk. And so we also have to look at what kind of technology can we use to make sure that we keep people safe. And so one technology that some parents are using is this new phone called a butterfly phone. And it's inexpensive. It only has a modest monthly fee. But you can pre-program it with a red, yellow, and blue button to call three different people. And so we always say make that red button be 911, make that yellow button be, I don't know, mom or dad and, you know, whoever on the other button. But that if the child is, is learning to walk home from school and you're worried about safety, 
um, maybe they could then walk with this um, adapted version of a cell phone so that they could call if something happens. We worked with another child who wanted to walk to school and walk back to school and he kept getting lost and risk was a problem and safety was an issue. And so for that child, um, he was about 10 and we were able to get him a service dog. And that service dog, um, I don't know how they did it, but the dog trainers um, trained the service dog uh, to walk the young boy to school. I get that. And then the little boy, when he got to in the door, the dog would walk home. I understand how they can train a dog to do that. But somehow the dog knew when it was 3 o'clock, and like five minutes to three, the dog would let itself out the little trap door after much training and be at the school waiting uh, before the bell rang and the little boy came home, it came out, and then he walked him home. He also taught the boy how to play more safely. They lived on a reasonably busy street, not terribly busy, but if the boy was playing with a ball and the ball went in the street and the boy tried to chase after the ball, the dog learned how to run faster than the boy and get in front of the boy and not let him get into the street and bark for somebody to come help. I'll tell you a story that once on a weekend, the little boy wandered away from home and was lost. The police were called. Everyone in town was called. The provider who trained the dog was called and said, you know, this young boy, this 10-year-old is lost. It's a Saturday afternoon. No one's seen him for over a half hour. We're very worried. And I said, where's the dog? And they said, well, the dog's in the house. And so we got the dog trainer out. The dog trainer had the dog smell the little boy's shirt and said, go find him. Well, you know, 20 minutes later, um, the dog was biting the little boy's shirt, not him. Just he had him by the shirt in his mouth safely and was dragging him home. Um, and it was great. He was safe. And how exciting. Um, my funniness though, was when the police officer called on Monday, I happened to be a provider at the agency that um, trained the support dogs, and they said, we'd like to know where the dog found the boy. And I said, yeah, so he's a really amazing trained dog, but he doesn't speak, so uh, he didn't tell us. We don't know. Um, supported decision-making is also... Um, what we used to use working with, with um, people with disabilities, but we're moving to supported decision making, where that we don't get guardians, we don't take people's rights away, but instead we empower the parents to become durable power of attorney when they turned 18 for health care, if, if it's needed, durable power of attorney for finance. And then let's look to put together a circle of support you know, is there a mom, is there a doctor, is there a neighbor, is there a circle of support once the person turns 18 that they can sit down with to help, you know, resolve those kinds of questions? We all use supports. I mean, when I buy a new car, I go and I ask my brothers, okay? When I wanted to buy my first house, I had a realtor, I had an attorney, I had a banker, and I had my dad. So my dad, you know, inspected the house, the realtor helped me find the house, the banker helped me afford the house, and the lawyer helped me do the papers to close on the house. And so nobody's independent. We're all interdependent, and we need to get more creative in using social capital to help people make important decisions. Robert Putnam wrote a book on social capital, and what he said is social capital means reciprocity. Well, reciprocity is a really big word. So what does reciprocity mean? It basically means if you do something for someone, they're more than likely to return the favor, okay? So it's not like, I'm going to do this for you and now you have to do this back. No, 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 no. But like, you know, I was at a block party the other day. And at this block party, it was all my neighbors, and somebody who knew somebody came up to me and said, hey, Kathy, I want to introduce you to this family. We invited them to the block party because they need help. And I'm like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. And they said, you know, she, they have a daughter, and she has cerebral palsy. She's, she's 16 years old, and she, she uses an electric wheelchair, and it's getting harder and harder for her mom to transfer her from the bus and get her in the house, and they need a ramp. And they went to the village and they asked for a, a permit to ramp the front porch and the village denied 
the permit in the zoning hearing because they said it looks like um, a deck and we don't allow decks in the in the front of the house. Well, my daughter with disabilities was standing next to me and she was appalled by the story. She goes, that's wrong, that's so mean. And so the parents, parents said, well, you know, do you think you can help? And Beth goes, I can. So here my daughter with disability gets out her iPhone she goes and pushes the button for Suri to talk to her, and Suri says, hello, Beth, how can I help you? And Beth says, call the mayor. And so Suri, of course, does, because the mayor is in Beth's cell phone as the mayor, because she can't read or write, so they have to be in them by how she calls. Well, she's best buds with the mayor, because when her support dog was being trained, the mayor's daughter with autism support dog was being trained, and they became best of buds, because Beth was helping his daughter with all kinds of things. So she speed dials the mayor. Hello, mayor. This is Beth, Beth Terrell. And she tells him the story the best she can, and he's confused, because her best, she couldn't explain it very well. So she said, wait, here's my mom. So I explain it. And he goes, where are you guys? I said, well, we're just, you know, at the black party at the class. And he goes, I'll be right over. Tell Beth Terrell she owes me a beer. And so the mayor comes over. He meets his family. He apologizes profusely and says, my goodness, I will um, arrange to be at your next zoning hearing. I will talk to the head of the zoning committee. But I say, why don't we all, all of us, go to the zoning hearing? And so, as a result, the zoning hearing was packed with neighbors and friends who wanted this to happen. The mayor himself was there testifying why this is a swell idea, because he only lived a couple blocks away. Beth Terrell is a person with a disability testified. And of course, as you know, the end of the story is that that ramp was built in the front porch. But not only was it built, this story got pressed. And because of all the friends and all of the people, there were like 25 people at the city council meeting that one of the local contractors said, you know what, why don't I just build it for you? And the local hardware store said, why don't we supply the, um, all of the hardware that you need? And so all of that came about because a friend knew a friend who brought a friend to the block party, introduced them to me. Beth Terrell was standing there, and she had social capital with the mayor and called them. And so you'd be surprised how people with disabilities' lives can be changed with social capital. This is Beth and her uh, roommate, uh, Suzanne. Uh, when Suzanne was 18, she moved to our town to go to this college uh, that has a program for young people with disabilities. And when the, um, Suzanne came to town, she didn't know anyone. Now she and Beth are our best of friends. Uh, they became Rotary volunteers together. They volunteered at the Park District. Um, Beth was asked to be a bridesmaid in her wedding. And now they both are employees of the Park, well, no, I should say they both were employees of the Park Districts from volunteering and building social capital. Suzanne has now switched jobs and she's working at the local grocery store as a cashier and Beth is in the after school program run by the Park District um, providing after school supports to kids. So you might say, well, how does she do that? How can she help them with homework? She can't read, she can't write. Oh, all the other employees love her because they help the kids with homework. Beth sets up all the snacks, she cleans up all the snacks, but most importantly in Chicago where it's cold like it is in Pennsylvania, uh, Beth takes the kids out to play every day and the other workers are thrilled because they don't want to go. Um, stories, 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 there's all kinds of stories, but I don't know what kind of time, so we'll come back to that. Um, this is a picture of Beth Terrell with Mike. Mike was a teacher, not at that school, but a teacher in another school. And he's a neighbor, and Beth kept wandering into his yard because her dad is allergic to cats and dogs, and Mike and his wife have cats and dogs. And she just kept going over, playing with the cat, playing with the dog. And one day she said, Mike, I need to go in your house. And he's like, why? And she's like, I have to go to the bathroom. And he's like, well, Beth Terrell, you just have to run home. And she goes, no, Mike, I really got to go. And so he said, no, you got to run home. 
Well, the next day he came over privately and he said, Kenny, I'm a teacher and I just don't know what to do. You know, I was just afraid that, you know, if I let her in the house and something happened and somebody accused me of doing something and I said, hey, Mike, how about this? If I was in your yard and I asked to go to the bathroom, what would you say? And you'd say, well, I'd say, well, Kev, go ahead. I said, well, why would you treat Beth differently just because she has a disability? And he goes, OMG. I just wasn't thinking. And now what Mike says, because not only does Beth go in and out of their house whenever she wants um, by their invitation, they go out to breakfast together, they go shopping together. And Mike says, I've never had such a wonderful friend as Beth Carroll. And that started when she was eight. Uh, social capital is about helping people in long-term relationships. It isn't just about, gosh, I'm going to do something for you and never do anything again. When we think about people with disabilities and students with disabilities, everybody's trying to do something for them. You know, the key club is wanting to do something, best buddies is wanting to do something, and that's okay. But how can they give back too? How can they join? So if there's a school project to, I don't know, collect aluminum, shouldn't they be collecting aluminum too? And if, you know, at the football game, they're looking for volunteers to sell popcorn and sell soda, can't they volunteer too? And so that's so important. And then there was John. And John was a young adult, he was about 22 years old. And when John uh, graduated from high school, um, he went into um, a shelter workshop. And this was a shelter workshop that was trying to reinvent itself and was trying to close the shelter workshop and get everybody jobs. And so they were trying to get John a job and they just were struggle, struggling. And so they came in and met with me. And at the time, I was the CEO of this agency. And I said, well, you know, we're a strength-based organization. Tell me the things that John can do. And they said, well, he really likes to spit. And I'm like, well, that's okay. And they like, he said, and he likes to, to, to run away from the shelter workshop. And he runs away and he goes to the 7-Eleven and he steals beer. But he always gets caught. And the police just bring him back to us. And they bring the six-pack back because he hasn't even touched it. But now he's learned that if he runs to the 7-Eleven and he gets a Miller Genuine Draft and he screws off the tap really fast, he can drink it before they call the police. I said, well, he sounds pretty smart to me. He likes he likes to play cards, and he always has a, a deck of cards in his back pocket, but he, he doesn't really know the rules for poker, but he, he seems to think he likes to play poker, and he seems to like hanging with guys better than girls, and he loves pancakes. And I said, well, let's see. Isn't John also the guy that goes around, whenever you come in the workshop, he goes, hi, my name is John. Do you have 50 cents? I want a soda. Hi, my name is John. You got 50 cents? I want a Coke. Hi, my name is John. You got 50 cents? You got a Coke. I got. I want a Coke. And I'm like, oh. Well, let's connect him first, and let's help him build social capital. And they're like, yeah, but where? And I said, let me make a call. Hello, Dave, it's Kath. Yeah. Listen, you know, I got this guy who really is, is wanting to join the club, and he really wants to give back to his community, and he needs to build social capital, to be quite honest, so he can get a job. And Dave's like, well, okay. And I said, you know, he, he, likes, uh, he likes to hang out with guys, and I know that your Kiwanis group is all men. And I know that after you have your official business meeting, you go to the back of the restaurant and there's a bar and you guys drink beer and play poker and tell stories. Isn't that true? Well, yeah. And don't you have a pancake breakfast? Well, yeah. Well, long story short, he volunteers at the pancake breakfast. He's made all kinds of friends. One of the Kiwanis Club members uh, picks them up every Sunday because they go to the same church and they go to church together. And um, he doesn't play poker, but while the guys are playing poker, he likes to watch. And he's doing great and he's making lots of friends. And one day at one of the meetings, John was going around saying, Hi, my name is John. Do you have 50 cents? I want to buy a Coke. And one of the guys says, You know, John, 
could you say something different? And he's like, what? And he goes, say, hi, my name is John. And he goes, hi, my name is John. And he goes, welcome to Walmart. Here's a cart. And John goes, welcome to Walmart. Here's a cart. What does that mean? He said, you know, John, I work at a place called Walmart. I'm the manager. We hire people. They stand in front of the store. And when someone comes in, they say, hi, welcome to Walmart. Here's a cart. He said, you know, if you do that, you get paid. If you get paid, you'll have money to buy beer. You'll have money to buy Coca-Cola. And you'll have money to take your girlfriend on a date. And John's like, really? He said, yeah. Why don't you, I'll call your staff and we'll get you in for an interview and, and we'll see how that works. Well, John's working at Walmart 20 hours a week. The first week, this guy bought him a 12-pack of Walmart cola and put it in the break. And now John has all kinds of money. He's not running away from anywhere because he's so happy at his job. He loves going to the Kiwanis meetings. He loves going to the pancake breakfast. And it's all because they took the time to say, how can we help John build social capital? And through that social capital, how can we help John find a job? So what are the advantages of helping students and adults build social capital? Well, Richard Florida wrote a book called The Rise of the Created Class. And in that he said that if you build social capital, then you'll have a friend you can confide in. Whether you use your voice to speak or not, you will have a friend that you can communicate with. You might have a neighbor who watches your house, and you might watch their house when they go away. You might have an uncle who helps you get a job. I was working with a guy the other day, and they were having trouble finding somebody a job. And all of a sudden, I got pulled in. And I said to them, I sat down with the person with a disability and their family and said, who do you know that can help us help him find a job? And they're thinking and thinking. And then all of a sudden they said, oh, well, his favorite uncle, his uncle Bob is the president of the local bank. I, I guess he might know somebody. I said, well, could you set up an appointment for us to go see Uncle Bob? So we go and see Uncle Bob and we tell him the deal. And Uncle Bob goes, well, hey. I know all the businesses in town. I know the businesses that are going to expand. I know the businesses that are going bankrupt. And I know the businesses that are new to town that are coming into town that need, need to hire. In fact, there's going to be a target opening, and they're going to be interviewing, and I know the manager. I can't get my nephew a job, but I could certainly ask, um, tell the manager that my nephew has filled out an application. And so we supported him to fill out an application. The manager assured that he at least got an interview, and then he got a job. A ride to the grocery store and ideas and information. Now think about C2P2. C2P2, in my opinion, is an amazing way to build social capital. Build social capital with professional experts. Build social capital with the amazing professionals at Temple University. But more importantly, building social capital amongst yourself, sharing with each other information and ideas and tips. And your son's in the eighth grade, and my son's just transitioning to middle school. Do you have any tips? Do you have any ideas and information? And that's what social capital gets you, access to ideas and information that can help your children. In Jane Jacobs' book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, she says that social capital is about people helping people. Communities use social capital to channel diversity, creativity, and achieve stability. And that's why there's so many social clubs. Communities encourage social clubs so that they can really have stability in the community. Wow, this didn't translate very well, but basically it says developing social capital and what the heck do people need? Well, Cohen and Prusik wrote a book called In Good Company, How Social Capital Makes Organizations Work. And what they say is in order to develop social capital, you need space and time 
to spend time with people. And so if you're in school all day and you're in class and you're listening and you're paying attention, you're not going to have as much time to build social capital. So the time and the place is before school, after school, and in the lunchroom. And so sometimes it's good to put a goal in the plan that says my child will be supported to develop friendships during the lunch period. But you need space and time. You need time to develop and demonstrate trust. If, if the aides sit my child next to a different child each time at lunch, I'm not going to get that opportunity to build trust and reciprocity. Okay? I know two kids that were in the uh, fourth grade. They, uh, they were sitting next to each other, one with cerebral palsy and one with not. And one of the things the young boy with cerebral palsy couldn't do is he couldn't open his milk carton. Well, I can't open my milk carton, but he, too, with cerebral palsy, couldn't open that milk carton. And all the time, the aide would come over and open it. And finally, the little boy next to him said, you know, I could just do that for him. Is that okay? Can I just open your milk carton for you? Or do you want to do that thing where I poke the hole and we just put the straw on the side, okay? And so it's that, that going back and forth. And then the, the, the young man um, with cerebral palsy sometimes brings a special treat in his lunch for his, for, his, for his lunch buddy friend. A means to effectively communicate. We don't all use our voice to speak, but we can all communicate. And so how do we work with the kids in the school to learn how to communicate to and from and it's amazing. These kids work it out themselves. They work it out better than any teacher. The kids got this one down. An opportunity for genuine participation it was really interesting. When my daughter was in the middle school, uh, well, when she was in grade school, she played basketball and loved it. It was the most important thing in her life was playing basketball. When she got to the middle school, it was very competitive, and she got cut from the team. But they offered that she could be the team manager. Well, she can't read and she can't write, so they want her to be the scorekeeper. Well, that wasn't, she couldn't do that without a peer mentor mentoring her to be the scorekeeper. And then they were like, well, she could do the water bottles and she could get the towels. And one day she came home and she said, Molly, I really just want to play. I don't want to just be on the bench being the manager. I want to play. And that's when we investigated and found Special Olympics. Um, and that way, she could still competitively play. She decided to stay on as the manager, but she joined Special Olympics so she can play. A genuine opportunity for participation, not just a mere presence. Now, at the end of that school year, the team bought a basketball and all signed it and presented it to Beth and thanked her for being the manager to recognize that she really had an important role to play. I'm going to skip this and just uh, finish talking about when I was a provider, we used to have a, we had a respite program. And in this respite program, we had a, a lot of money and a lot of parents, but we weren't very effective getting respite workers to the parents when they wanted it. And so we had a focus group with the families and they said, you know, you got respite workers, but you spend a lot of money training them. And then, the other problem is um, they don't want to work the hours we want. We want a respite worker Saturday night, and nobody wants to be a respite worker Saturday night. They want to they want to work Wednesday afternoon. Why don't they need a respite worker Wednesday afternoon? And so in the focus group, they said we want to drive the process. We want it to be a self determination. We want the money to be empowered to us. We don't want it to be professionally driven. And so we changed it. And after we changed it, Beth Terrell said, you know, Mom, we get respite too. And it used to give you a break from me, but now I need a break from you and Dad. I need more friends, so can't we use this respite to help me build more friends? And so we converted the respite program to a self-determined model. The parents are encouraged to use the dollars to expand their social capital and natural supports. And I'll end with a social capital respite story. So we were working with, with a couple who had three boys. Uh, the three boys were under the age of 10. All three boys had autism, and all three boys liked to run away. 
And so we were able to, under the self-determination model, give them a portion of the respite budget to put a fence in their backyard. So if the children ran, they were, they were safe. And then they had some money for respite workers. And, and we, we, we worked with them to brainstorm. And what we realized is that these kids were true runners. They loved to run away. And so one of the staff said, well, you know, I know that the captain of the running team at the local high school is looking for a part-time job, but he can only work weird hours because he always has practice after school. And I was like, yeah, well, we'd like weird hours. How about Saturday morning, Sunday afternoon, and Monday night? And so they hired the um, the captain of the running team and two of his running team members to be the respite workers. They were seniors. They were 18 years old. We could hire them with the respite dollars. And what they did is they came and they picked up the kids and they went running. And they ran and they ran and they ran and they ran. And an hour later, they brought the kids back. And when they brought the kids back, the kids were exhausted. So the mother got an hour of respite while they were running. And then she got an hour of respite after they came back from running because they were exhausted. And then the boy said, well, can we bring our girlfriends? Can they run with us too? And the mom was like, sure. So now you've got three high school seniors and three high school juniors, and they're all running together. And then the junior girls are like, hey, can we bring your sons to watch um, the running meet? And so they got free time. I mean, they didn't have to pay for those respite hours. The ju junior girls took them running to the running meet, and they watched the running meet, and they brought them back. And when the high school seniors graduated from high school, the high school juniors became seniors, and they began to take over. And so it's just a simple example of using social capital because now those kids are friends. They look up to those seniors. Those, those seniors are their buddies. And on their own time, those seniors are calling up to the house and saying, hey, we're thinking about going to a movie. Do you think the boys would like to go with us? And so true, true friendship. So now we're at about 7.15. It's time for me to open it up for questions, comments, suggestions. And so, Kathy, do we have any questions? Oh, I think I, I have to do something to give it back to you. Hi, Kathy. It's it's Kathy. No, we don't have any questions yet. Oh, we do. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't see that question. So sorry. We do have questions. So uh, one of the first questions, Kathy, is where can we access the prompts for such goal planning? I think Beth's goals are awesome. That's from one of the parents. Um, where can you get the prompts? Um, well, I think this was recorded, and so in here, I think I gave you the actual language that we used for her goals, the two goals. Uh, one is that Beth will be supported to um, develop friends during the during the lunchtime, and the other was that was kind of a goal for inclusion, which was uh, Beth will um, Beth will learn. Um, well, where did I put it? Now I forget what the exact language was. Um, um, anyway, I don't remember the exact language, but it's it's on the tape. And then those peaks, the P E A C, you can get technical assistance from Temple, and they can give you ideas of different kinds of ways to write goals for inclusion and for. Um, for building social capital. Uh, when Beth went to high school, one of her goals was um, not only will Beth be supported at lunch to make friends, but that Beth was um, Beth was to be supported um, in at least one club to actively participate and 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 give back. Um, and that one we had to struggle with a bit because of course it was an after school activity. Uh, but they did actually come around. That's great. Yeah, that's uh, brilliant, Kath. And especially to um, talk to our peak parent consultants, if you're needing some assistance, please go on that website and uh, and look for that. So one other question we have, Kathy, is um, a person asks that or states that she works with a lot of families. 
who are um, immigrants living in extreme poverty, and um, the social capital seems to be uh, very limited for them. How would you suggest that they leverage the limited capital for these families? How do they access the social capital that may be more available to other families? So people who perhaps don't, um, English is not their first language, and they're not as connected in the communities. Any suggestions? Sure. One of the places that we find that are very open is churches. And so if they are willing, um, churches are a place where you not only go for spirituality, but a lot of churches have social functions. Some churches have an after-service coffee or a before-service coffee. Many churches will have a meet and greet. A lot of churches will have like a new member um, welcoming once a month. I, I think that's one way. Um, the other is that if they can manage, and I know how difficult it is because often both parents are working, but but a lot of times social capital is um, is built when parents uh, walk their kids to school and drop them off or pick them up after school. Um, another place is to um, join the the PTA, the Parent Teacher Association. Um, because that's a way to, you know, volunteer, bond, give back, and and to grow. Um, it's a little harder with the service organizations because even with the Rotary and the Kiwanis, you have to pay dues if you're very low income. That that's a lot harder. Often churches don't require any kind of, you know, they, they request a donation, but if you can't make it, you can't make it, and you make the donation that you can make. Um, I think the other is, um, you know, playgrounds are a really good place to build social capital. You know, if if the parents can, um, they can go to the um, the playground. Um, on Saturdays, on Sundays, in the summer, other parents will be there. You could say hi. You could start to engage. Um, that's, you know, the, the easiest place, I think, to build social capital is when you have a child or a dog because people will go up and say hi, or is that your child, or is that your dog, or oh, is that your little girl, she's so cute, or is that your little boy. Now, where English is not their first language, um, I don't have as much expertise on that in terms of um, ways in particular communities to build social capital, um, but um, often, um, you know, it's amazing. Like food pantries usually have places um, where you not only can pick up food, but you could maybe be linked to other families or other people, or you you might like say to the person at the food pantry, you know, I'm really trying to connect to see if there's another Spanish speaking or Chinese speaking or whatever speaking, you know, family um, who has a child with a disability that I can be connected to. Uh, sometimes the school social worker, um, can't, you know, there's rules about confidentiality, but the school social worker maybe could, you know, maybe you, you live in a town where there's four grade schools. And this particular family is at this grade school, but another uh, family is at a different grade school that is the same Spanish speaking or Russian speaking or Somali speaking. Um, and so maybe the social worker can connect you. Um, that's where I would probably start, but then once again, I would refer you back to PEAK. Uh, they're amazing. They have amazing technical assistance, and they would be better able to come up with additional ideas specific to Pennsylvania. Okay, great. Um, here's another question. It's, it's a statement, so I'm just looking at it now. Um, oh, um, this parent noticed that it worked well for Beth to join Special Olympics, and um, that's probably best for this woman's daughter as well. However, some friends I know seem to be so bent on inclusion with typical peers that they might not be open to Special Olympics and would rather uh, that their child be included with the typical team. 
Um, this uh, parent tried with her daughter, and due to her medical issues, um, we ended up no longer participating. But in the future, we will probably, in that case, go with the group that is more in her her um, league, so to speak. I'm reading this. So uh, that's my thought. Not really a question, is it? Uh, to summarize, maybe the question is, um, you know, what, what's your opinion about starting at some specialized um, programs for people to, to build social capital? Yeah. Well, um, I believe in full inclusion, um, but I also think that we all have our own little um, preferences. So, um, like, um, I'm a fully included person, but um, once a month on Friday night, I go to a segregated book club that only allows women, no men, and women who drink wine, and women who drink wine and read books. And so I have my own little, my own little special group. Um, special Olympics, I used to think, oh my goodness. But the reality is, if, if, if our children want to play competitive sports, and they are cut from teams. My daughter still was the manager so that she continued those friendships, but she wanted an avenue. Well, Special Olympics has now evolved and they have what's called, and I don't know if I have it exactly right, but I think it's called peer-to-peer um, -peer sports. So now my daughter does Special Olympics golf, but how it works is she is linked with a person without a disability, and she and this person without a disability play competitive golf together. Now, she still does competitive Special Olympics basketball just with people with disabilities because she loves it. And who am I to tell her that she can't do it because it's something she loves? Now, if I only had my daughter doing segregated disability-only activities, I think somebody would say, yo, how is she going to make friends without, with people without disabilities? But I think what we've learned in the field now is that it's okay to make friends of people with and without disabilities. And sometimes friends decide to do certain, you do certain things with certain friends. And so if she's going to go to the movies, she may or may not go with a friend with a disability. She, if she's going to go shopping, she may or may not go with a friend with a disability. But if she's going to play basketball, she's going to play basketball with people with disabilities. Now, if she's home, she might play pickup ball with people in, in the neighborhood. But um, for her, it's a choice. It's an informed choice. She's been provided opportunities to do other things. Um, but it's also not the only thing she does. And it's only, you know, one thing. She does Special Olympics once a week, and she does other kinds of things that are fully included other times during the week. I don't know if that helps, but that's, that's what happens. Right. Thank you, Kathy. One last statement, really, from someone uh, talking about how their library brought, to, brought together people who um, oops, wanted to um, know more about homeschooling and resources for folks with disabilities, so another, you know, community resource of getting, coming together, whether it be a book club like you have or just a group specifically for, you know, homeschoolers, sort of that whole PTA idea, um, so. Good idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, so. Well, I think our time is drawn to a close. I want to remind people that this uh, webinar will be, and the PowerPoint will be posted. I know some people came in very late, and we really, um, you know, if you read the, the PowerPoint slides, you'll, you'll be able to uh, fully um, get the, the message. And we also, this session will be archived and closed captioned. So it takes a, a couple of weeks to get the closed captioning, and we don't like to put the webinar on um, our, our um, website until it is closed captioned. But you will be able to, right after, and I would um, estimate at this point, during the after the holidays at the first of the year, for those of you who may have missed some of Kathy's um, information, you'll be able to go on our website and listen to it again. But right now, I really want to thank Kathy so very much for this presentation and remind you all those of you who are, uh, wa have watched the webinar from their, uh, your home computer, when you uh, close out of it, the uh, evaluation will pop up. 
I see that some people are on their phone, so we have your email address, so just look for that email, and please take the five minutes to complete our evaluation. Well, again, thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you uh, again in the spring when we have our session on homeschoolers and evaluations. Take care, Kathy. So good uh, listening to you. Bye, everybody. Have a nice evening. You too. Good night.